Hey guys, Greg Knuckles here, back with the 11th, I think, installment of the String Theory semi-daily Q&A series. Uh, and today's question is, uh, in my opinion, what are some of the biggest gaps uh, facing exercise in sports science right now in the scientific literature? Um, so there are, just right off the top of my head, two biggies that come to mind. Uh, the first would be that we don't have all that much really, really long-term data. Uh, and the second is that we have a lot of data about, um, you know, factors that are going to be better for most people most of the time on average, uh, but not all that much work has been done about how to optimize a training program for the individual. So the first issue, the fact that we don't have uh, just a ton of long-term data, uh, this isn't something that uh, I hold against the scientific community at all. Um, because work like that, it's it's incredibly expensive and unwieldy to do. Uh, so there are a lot of studies looking to see, uh, you know, what produces the best results over six weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, 16 weeks, uh, some all the way out to 20 weeks. Um, and, you know, that's a pretty decent chunk of time. Like, that's going to be a training cycle or longer for, for most people. Um, you know, there may be some Olympic athletes watching this on a quadrennial plan, but for most of us, you know, we're only planning training 12, 16 weeks in advance most of the time. Uh, so that is, you know, that, that is very good, helpful data uh, on that time scale. But something to keep in mind is that most of the studies are maxing out at 12 to 16 weeks or so. So that makes it difficult to... Uh, say with just a ton of confidence that one that one uh, approach is going to produce a lot better results than another approach over, you know, two, three, five, ten years. Um, it very well could be that something produces really quick results in the short term, and then the results kind of peter out, whereas something else produces kind of more moderate results over a longer period of time. And so there very well may not be meaningful long-term differences between those two different approaches. Um, that's just something that's that we can't really say uh, with a ton of confidence right now, just because there aren't many, you know, two, three, four year training studies being done. That would be one incredibly hard to recruit people for say like, hey, turn your training over to me for the next half a decade. Most people aren't going to do that. Two, it's going to be a really expensive study to run. And then three, it's just going to be a huge pain in the ass. So there's not a ton of stuff out there like that right now. Um, which does, which does limit um, the time scales that we can speak confidently on. Uh, science is really, really good at sports science, exercise science at this point, uh, telling us what's probably going to work well, you know, over the next three or four months. Um, but then past that, straight up, we are just kind of extrapolating from there. Um, and then the second issue that there's a ton of data about what produces uh, superior results on average for most people most of the time, uh, but not all that much about how to individualize a training plan. Um, so the way science typically works in this field is you'll have one group on one exercise plan, one group on another exercise plan, and typically con a control group as well doing nothing. Uh, and then, you know, after three or four months of training, you see which one of those protocols produced better results on average. So you're taking means, standard deviations. Um, most research still works with p-value, so a frequentist statistical approach to see um, at a p-level of less than 0.05 which one of these produced better results. So that's, that's how most research is done. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the protocol that won out is going to be better for everyone. It just produces on average the best results. Uh, there is some work being done. There was a study by Beaven and a more recent one, blanking on the researcher's name, maybe Brown. I'll link him in the description. Um, but yeah, there is some research being done showing, well, I guess kind of validating um, that, you know, simply put, some things work better for, for some people than other people. Uh, what may be kind of the optimal thing based on our current scientific understanding um, that's probably going to produce good results for the majority of people, but it may be very inappropriate for some people. Uh, whereas something that uh, may not be as scientifically validated 
may very well produce better results for a minority of people. Uh, and there's, there's very, very little work in that area um, being done thus far. Uh, and again, that's, uh, that's primarily a, a logistical problem as well. Um, because to do that type of research, you would need crossover studies. So you would need uh, two groups. Uh, group one does protocol A, group two does protocol B for 12, 16 weeks, whatever. Then have a pretty lengthy washout period in between. And then group one does protocol B, group two does protocol A. And then kind of tease out what factors separated uh, the people who did best on protocol A versus who did best on protocol B, with everyone doing both of the protocols at some point during the study. Uh, again, those studies, they take twice as long to do. They're going to be more than twice as expensive, much harder to recruit people for. Um, so again, I, I'm certainly not uh, begrudging the scientific community for not having more of those types of studies. Um, because, yeah, they would just be a huge pain in the ass. But to this point, there's just not... Uh, a ton of that type of data to to really look at uh, individualizing approaches um, based on the scientific literature, and so uh, really to this point, um, that's that's not an incredibly huge drawback because uh, what what I've always recommended is using the scientific data as a starting point, and then just personalizing your own training program, your clients' training programs from there. Uh, just based on how they're responding to it. So at this point, you know, training yourself or training other people, it is just as much of an art as a science. So, you know, you have that starting point, you can get that from science, but then personalizing it, uh, that's going to have to come from you and your own experiences and, you know, how you're responding to your training, how your clients are responding to their training. So, um, yeah, as I see it, those are right now the two uh, biggest gaps in the scientific literature for um, people trying to use uh, a very, very purely scientific approach to planning their own training, their planning, uh, their clients' training. Um, and again, neither neither one of those things are things that I hold against the scientific community at all, because getting that type of data um, would be very expensive and very laborious. But uh, as it stands now, those are I think the two the two biggest issues. Um, so you know, for uh, for at least a while, uh, there's going to be plenty plenty of space um, for lifters, coaches, um, you know, to apply their own experiences uh, on top of the scientific literature to you know really optimize training for yourself for your clients. Uh, so that is the video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe. And if you have a question you want answered, ask it in the comments below. And if it is my favorite, I will answer it in that next video. All right, until next time, guys, uh, hope you have a good day. Hope your training is good, and I'll see you in the next video.